Okay, so well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kalyan. Thank you, organizers. Thank you, everybody. Uh, it's good to see uh, a vibrant conference in progress. Uh, sorry that I can't join you in person. Uh, the title of my talk is Fermat Quotients and the Ankeny Art and Chala Conjecture. What's uh, going on here? Um, I'm not able to. I'm not able to. Yeah, let me just see if I can. Uh, yeah, is, can you see it now? Still there. Yes, abstract of five. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the abstract of my talk is um, here. In 1951, Ankeny, Artin, and Chawla, who you see in this uh, slide. Um, that uh, that uh, kind of a rectangle is there with the little, uh, with written, please move this window away from the yeah, can you can you see it now? I mean, is yes. it well? Unfortunately, I'm not able to. Um, let's see. Maybe maybe if I stop sharing and try this again. Yeah, that would be better. Yeah. Okay. How's that now? Is that better? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah now it's better. Okay. So uh, Ankeny, Art, and Chala derived a congruence for the class number of Q root P with P prime congruent one mod four. And they related it to the fundamental unit T plus U root P over two of that field. And they conjecture that U is always co-prime to P. So I hope everybody understands their result. Very simple to state. You have a real quadratic field Q root P. P is a prime congruent one mod four. In a real quadratic field, there's a fundamental unit uniquely determined, t plus u root p over two. You can write it like that. And their conjecture is that the coefficient of root p is not divisible by p. Now, this conjecture remains open to this day, a very beautiful conjecture. Uh, in this talk, we'll connect the conjecture to the study of Fermat quotients and derive an assortment of related results. Uh, this is going to work with my current doctoral student, Nick. Fellini, who I put a picture here, um, and uh, we're, our work is still in progress. Hopefully, we'll finish it uh, within a few weeks. Uh, now, the <laughs> interesting thing about our paper is that is it possible? Maybe something is not. I should be muted. Maybe some. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. Can maybe can. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Is it is that okay? I mean. Yeah, okay, I think, yeah, thank you. Uh, so there's a there's a funny history of this uh, Anthony Artin Chawla paper. Uh, the results of this paper were first announced in 1951 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, a two-page paper. And there were four results in total that were announced. And the full paper was published a year later in 1952 in the Annals of Mathematics However, the paper contains proofs of only three of the four results. And our guess is that the authors forgot about the fourth. Uh, and in the following year, Leonard Carlitz published a proof of the fourth relation in the Proceedings of the American Mathematical Society, but again, left out of the proof some crucial insights. One crucial insight has to do with the introduction of the Piatic logarithm a revolutionary idea in the history of number theory. So as far as I know, the Piatic logarithm makes its first appearance in the Ankeny Art and Chawla paper. Although some, um, uh, some of the idea it was nascent in the works of Eisenstein and Kummer, the first person to see the importance of this was Iwasawa. Is a question? Yes. yes. No. I was going to point out Kummer had done it too. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, is that Larry Washington? I'm, I'm hi. okay. I, Larry, hi, Larry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, I, I mentioned that Kummer. Had done it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, but but the explicit uh, development, I think, the uh, first explicit development of the idea was Eva Salam. Uh, part of this omission can be understood. Uh, so why did the uh, authors of the Ankeny Art and Chala paper omit this? Um, 
uh, discussion of the piadic logarithm in explicit terms. Uh, <clears throat> it could be understood if we compare the ages of the author. So, so I'm kind of doing a psychoanalysis here. Ankeny was 24, Arden was 53, and Chalo was 44. Now, of the three, the youngest is Ankeny, who had just completed his PhD under Arden at the very young age of 23. And very likely, Ankeny held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Institute for Advanced Study because he's listed there as a fellow from 51 to 52. And Chawla is also listed there as a visitor. Now, Chawla and Selberg had been already collaborating on their famous Chawla Selberg paper, uh, which was again announced in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 1949, uh, 1949 or 50. Anyway, they were working on this thing, and that paper. I think people know the story that that too is a, is a paper that took about 10 or 15 years to come out. Um, Chawla was there. And so very likely Anthony and Chawla um, hit it off very well. Um, and uh, they started discussing these things. And of course, this, this could be, I'm not 100% sure, but this could have been part of Anthony's uh, PhD thesis, I, although I haven't been able to check that. Now, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences paper is a two-page announcement containing four theorems. Here they are. So H of D, so they start off by saying H of D is the class number of the real quadratic field Q root D. Uh, now, notice D is not a, necessarily a prime number here. And epsilon is a fundamental unit of Q root D. And then D is factorized as P times M, where P is an odd prime and M is an integer. And then uh, you have the Legendre symbol then their theorem is that if p is bigger than three, m is bigger than one, then you have this beautiful congruence for two times h u over t in terms of a very finite, finitely explicitly defined sum using Legendre symbols. And in case p equals three, there's an additional factor of one plus m on the left side of this equation. Um, and part two of the paper uh, gives the other results, uh, theorem two, so if D is P, if D is a prime and congruent of five mod eight, then you have a beautiful, very simple looking congruence for the class number. And chi is this quadratic character. Um, chi V is a real primitive character mod M. And then they have a beautiful Bernoulli number style congruence for their uh, relation, namely two H U over T is given by this C times C sub P minus three over two, where C sub P minus three over two the C sub n's are given by these coefficients of this um, Bernoulli polynomials. Um, and um, so it's a beautiful congruence there as well. And the elusive theorem four is stated at the very end. Let A denote the product of all the quadratic residues of P lying between zero and P, and the product of the quadratic non-residues lying between zero and P, let B be that. Then you have this beautiful congruence, if P is congruent to one mod four, two H U over T is congruent to A plus B over P. That's a very beautiful theorem. Has not, you don't need to talk about Legendre symbols. You don't need to talk about, um, you know, characters or Bernoulli numbers. In their annals paper, theorem four is neither mentioned or proved. And that's a, it's kind of strange uh, development. And uh, theorem three is, is the closest in their annals paper. Theorem three uh, is the statement here, d equals p, then four u h over t is given by this sum mod p, uh, where g is any quadratic non-residue. And if d is equal to p is five mod eight, then you have a very explicit cover. This is the closest we come to anything that resembles theorem four in their announcements of the proceedings paper. And at the, after stating theorem three, they say, a question arises in relation to the work in this paper, which the authors were unable to solve. Is u not zero mod p? If d equals p and epsilon is the fundamental unit, t plus u root p over two, um, then can we always say that p does not divide u? And then they say, for all primes congruent to five mod eight and p less than 2000, we verified that u is not zero mod p. It's quite possible that people have, I didn't check this, but I'm sure many people have probably improved this 2000 bound. And uh, to this day, this uh, question still is um, unresolved. And they were smart enough to say uh, the question whether it's always true seems quite difficult. 
Now, if u is uh, not zero mod p, why are you interested in this um, in this um, condition? So uh, th this should be there should have been a mod p there. I think uh, p is missing in that mod. If u is not zero mod p, then this congruence actually determines the class number in terms of capital A, capital B, U and T, you see, because U and T are determined from the fundamental unit. So they're beautiful app, you know, app, um, algorithms that go back to Brahma Gupta, Bhaskar Acharya, et cetera, that will give you the fundamental unit explicitly. So U and T can be algorithmically determined very quickly. Uh, and uh, determining the quadratic residues and the non-residues also can be done algorithmically very clearly. And then you, um, you just solve this congruence and you find H is congruent with something mod P. And that something mod P will be the class number because we know that H is less than square root P by a uh, famous result of Newman. <clears throat> now, um, <clears throat> let's go back into this history of uh, Emil Arten, uh, advisor uh, par excellence. Um, so Anthony comes after Tate as Arten's student in Princeton in 1951. Tate had just completed his celebrated thesis in which uh, at Arten's suggestion, he developed the Adelic perspective to derive the analytic continuation functional equation of the Dedekind zeta function of an arbitrary number field. Now, the analytic continuation functional equation of the Dedekind zeta function had been done earlier by Hecke, but using classical methods following essentially Riemann's recipe of theta functions of several variables. But Artin's insight had been to use a Fourier analytic approach on the Adele ring of a number field. And he thought that this should give at one glance the analytic continuation and functional equation of the Dedekind zeta function. Now, this is an interesting phrase uh, um, uh, of, at one glance. Uh, I saw the, uh, in, when I read uh, some of other Artin's papers, um, I saw that he likes to use that word at one glance. So understanding for him should come instantaneously at one glance. Um, and um, I think he held on to that particular philosophy of mathematics throughout his life. Uh, his um, aesthetic elegance in all of his papers um, demonstrate that very uh, clearly. And uh, surprisingly, this paper of Anthony Artin and Chawla does not show the Artinian elegance that you would expect in some of the other papers. So my conjecture that uh, it was the junior author that wrote the paper still stands. Now, Artin had been motivated uh, in his Adelic perspective by a celebrated theorem of Strowski that states that the only metric you can impose on the rational number field is, is the usual absolute value or the p-adic metrics for every prime p. Uh, classical analysis has a p So classical, anything that's in classical analysis should have a p-adic analog. And I'm sure this is the perspective that Anthony, uh, Artin had. And it seems to me that Chowell and Anthony had been looking at class numbers of real quadratic fields from a very classical approach, pardon the uh, double pun, and Artin essentially introduced the p-adic logarithm in the paper. So it's pretty clear that uh, this revolutionary idea appears probably with Artin's insight. And if one reads the annals paper, it would seem the junior author really wrote the paper with some help from Chowla and perhaps Artin gave a cursory approval at the end. That's the only explanation I can come up with for the omission of theorem four. So the ankeny artin chala theorem, if you look at this fundamental unit, um, they stated the result that two HU over T is congruent to A plus B over P mod P. Now H is the class number of Q root P and A is the product of the residues uh, lying in one root P and B is the product of the quadratic non-residues lying in one P. And this was one of the four results stated in their announcement in PNAS. And a complete proof is not given. And uh, Karlitz, I think, is the first person who notices this. And he tries to fill the gap in his paper written a year later. But again, he fails to underline the introduction of the Piatic logarithm as a key step. It seems to us, I mean, us is uh, Nick Fellini, my student and myself, it seems to us that it was somehow taboo to use the p log 
um, at that time, 1950s, maybe early 50s, similar to the taboo uh, that people had of using square root minus one in the 18th century. You know, many, many of the great mathematicians probably were using square root minus one in their calculations, but then finally they would erase all such um, usage. Uh, something like that seems to have been happening. And uh, our focus of attention is this particular congruence. And our research begins by asking what happens if you replace A and B by quadratic residues and non-residues lying in other intervals. You don't have to take them. They have to, according to their theorem, A and B have to lie in this interval one P, one to, one to P. But what happens if you take them lying in some other intervals? What, how does the theorem change? That's a simple question. So our theorem is, if uh, P is congruent to one mod four is a prime and A sub S and B sub S are positive numbers representing a complete set of quadratic residues and non-residues, they don't have to lie in the interval one to P, they could be in other intervals. Then let A star and B star be the product of the A sub S and B sub S respectively. Then our theorem is that A star plus B star divided, it's divisible by P, that's easy to show, divided by P is congruent to 2HU over T plus this extra sum. This extra sum is A star summation, the greatest integer of A sub S over P, one over A sub S plus B star summation, greatest integer of B sub S over P, one over B sub S mod P. And this generalizes the ankeny artin chalov theorem because if the A sub S and B sub S lie in the interval one to P as their theorem stipulates, then you can see that the, the sums in our theorem just completely vanish because A sub S is less than P, therefore the greatest integer of A sub S over P is zero. So there's nothing there. Uh, our proof is not hard and we're gonna give it. So, um, uh, you know, famous uh, joke is that uh, every talk should have a um, proof of a theorem and a joke and uh, they shouldn't be the same. <laughs> so <laughs> hopefully this is not a joke. Uh, okay, so you take your A sub S and let's write A sub S as uh, reduced residue A sub S plus P times the greatest integer A sub S over P where this diamond X denotes the reduced residue of X mod P. Then in the ankeny artin chala notation, A capital A and capital B are the product of the things in the interval one to P. So to get them in, in the interval one to P, you subtract off this um, you know, P times A sub S of P. And then you have this, uh, these two uh, terms, capital A and capital B in terms of the A sub S. Now, having this in hand, we, we will write A star to be the product of A sub S and B star to be the product of B sub S. And then we easily see that if you compute this product modulo P squared, I'm, I'm gonna do all the details, but uh, more or less, you'll see that A is congruent A star minus P A star times summation A sub S over P, one over A sub S mod P squared, and the same applies for B star and B. And therefore putting it all together, A plus B is the same as A star plus B star minus P times these extra sums mod P squared. And therefore A plus B over P is congruent to A star plus B star over P minus this, this extra sum mod P. <clears throat> and so that's how, that's the proof. It's very simple, isn't it? Um, to see, but all of this, all of a sudden, once you make this um, observation, I would say, um, you get some interesting corollaries. So let's see what they are. One of them is if we take if we take the a sub s to be the quadratic residues lying in the interval one to p, as in the Ankeny Art and Chala set up, set up, then a star is just simply a. And then we have this corollary that uh, A plus B star over P is congruent to 2HU over T plus B star times this extra sum. Now, if you fix a non-residue between zero and P and consider a complete set of res representatives of quadratic residues, A sub S, then we can get all the non-residues by multiplying through the quadratic residues by this fixed non-residue. So let's set B sub S to be 
n times a sub s. So we obtain a complete set of representatives for the quadratic non-residues this way. And because n is a non-residue, we have by the basic Euler criterion that n to the p minus one over two is congruent to minus one mod p. And the congruence in the above corollary now becomes um, a times one plus n to the p minus one over two over p is congruent to h u over t minus capital A times the sum, summation NAS over P times one over NAS. When I write one over NAS, by the way, I mean the inverse of one NAS mod P. Okay. Uh, so now we are beginning to see uh, some sort of uh, formal quotients kind of coming into this picture. Uh, if we suppose that P divides U, then the first term on the right-hand side vanishes and we have that one plus n to the p minus one over two divided by p is just simply minus of the sum. The a is canceled because a is co-prime to p. Now, assuming that p divides u, we have, uh, we have shown this congruence that a times that, and then we reduced, um, we divided by a and, and, just, and derived a new congruence, one plus n to the p minus one over two divided by p is congruent to this sum. And this leads to our theor one theorem that, that if P divides U, then for any complete set of quadratic residues, you have this congruence, one plus N to the P minus one over two divided by P is the sum. Now, you, we did this with the quadratic residue. You could kind of play the reverse game and do it with the non-residues and multiply the non-residues by an N, it's the same N, and you get a complete set of residues. So you can, there's obviously another dual congruence here. Okay, so in particular, you get this congruence because here now, how did I get this? Uh, we got this by multiplying uh, by n to the p minus one over two minus one. n to the p minus one over two because n is a non-residue is minus one mod p. So this factor is minus two mod p. And if I multiply both sides of the congruence by this factor, then you get the Fermat quotient neatly on the left-hand side, n to the p minus one over p is congruent two times the sum. And as I said, we could, um, uh, we could reverse the procedure and do it with other things as well. So I'll come to that in a second, but let me just refresh your memory on the Fermat quotient. If A is co-prime to B, Fermat's little theorem, of course, says A to the P minus one is one mod P. And uh, this motivates the following remark. The Fermat quotient is f of a equal to a to the p minus one minus one divided by p. Sorry, the, the, the p uh, has been cut off there. Uh, and it turns out that uh, this uh, behaves somewhat like a logarithm. This is uh, an interesting fact. f of a b is congruent to f of a plus f of b mod p. Uh, and, and the way to see that is simply by writing a to the p minus one as one plus p times f of a, f of a. And uh, so that one plus P F of A B is just simply A B to the P minus one. And then you factor that as one plus P times F of A, one plus P times F of B, and then uh, write, write it out. And then you immediately see modulo P squared, you have this kind of logarithmic style property. And so in our main theorem, we're gonna fix a, a quadratic non-residue and now take the dual, the B sub S as a complete, we define a complete set of quadratic residues this way. And then by repeating the procedure as I indicated in the previous slide, you get another congruence N to the P minus one over two plus one is the summation N B S this time. And again, we multiply by minus two and then you get a nice congruence for the Fermat quotient again, one more time. So, the, so this is how we relate uh, the Ar ankeny arten chawla conjecture and the Fermat quotients. If uh, P divides U, then on one hand, you have N to the P minus one minus one over P is congruent two times summation N B S over P times one over N B S. And then you have, um, you have, uh, you, sorry, there's a, I think there was uh, some, uh, I might have um, lost a slide somewhere here. So uh, I'm just trying to figure this out. Um, I don't know how to go back on my thing. So <laughs> sorry, uh, I don't know how to go back on my um, thing here unless I, I get out of this thing. So I think I'll just continue. Uh, so the P, let's go back. Uh, um, 
and and uh, let's, let's see if this works. Oh, it does work. Okay, okay. So so what we have is n to the p minus one over p is this, and then we also have n to the p minus one minus one over p is something similar with a sub s. So I forgot to write that down. I don't know why they disappeared because in my original slides I did have it. Maybe I forgot to save it. Um, anyway, we get two congruences. This is what this means. Two rigid congruence relations mod p have to be satisfied by the same Fermat quotient. Okay. Now, in the um, in the Anthony Art and Chala paper, uh, is there a question? I, I'm hearing some rumbling. Is there a question? No, 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 no question. Oh, okay, okay. In their paper, Ankeny, Art, and Chawla introduced the Piatic logarithm, but they never explicitly developed the theory. It's a kind of, a, it's a mishmash of a paper. It's a very badly written paper, actually. Uh, anyway, the formal development was done later by Ivasawa, as I mentioned before. But to elucidate the lacuna in their paper, let us review some basic facts. Now, one can define the Piatic log using power series. Uh, as, you, as you all know, you have this classical power series for the logarithm. And the piatic series summation a n converges if and only if the nth term goes to zero. So this is a very nice convergence criterion in for piatic series. And so we would like to see when this uh, logarithm function converges in the piatic uh, in the piatic metric. So if v p of n is the largest power of p dividing n, we denote by absolute values of p to be the standard piatic metric. And uh, if x equals a over b, g c d of a and b are one. Um, then the piatic absolute value of X is defined as P to the VP of B minus VP of A. I'm sure all of you know this, but I'm just reviewing this for the basis, for the benefit of um, any students in the, in the room. Uh, since for a given prime P, uh, VP of N is at most log N over log P, we see that if the absolute piatic absolute value of uh, X is equal to lambda is less than one, then this series actually converges piatically because all you have to do is check that the nth term goes to zero piatically, of course. And indeed it does. So you have this nice um, uh, criterion that uh, we have the logarithm function actually does converge in the usual um, disk, open disk, mod x less than one. Now, one can extend this piatic logarithm. And I said, this is uh, classical results, uh, I think due to Itozawa but they're nicely presented in uh, Larry Washington's book on cyclotomic fields. And uh, the students who are interested can uh, learn much from this exposition. It can be extended to the entire uh, CP as it were. So as usual, we denote QP the completion of Q with respect to the piatic metric. And then we take its algebraic closure, QP bar. Then we complete it again with respect to the piatic metric. And then we get something called C sub P which is the analog of the complex numbers. And it turns out this field is algebraically closed. So there's no further need to take closure, completion, closure, completion. You're stuck, you're, you're, by the time you get to CP, you're done. And the piatic logarithm can be now extended to all of this um, piatic complex plane in such a way that the functional equation log x, y equals log x plus log y is satisfied. And we define log p to be zero to avoid, avoid confusion with the usual logarithm. We'll define denote the piatic log as log sub p. And in their in their paper, Ankin, Art, and Chala observed that the piatic log is related to the Fermat quotient, and they deduce this uh, as follows: um, If we take um, x, which has piatic absolute value less than one. Um, that's equivalent to saying that the piatic valuation of X is positive. And if the piatic valuation is bigger than one over P minus one, then you can check the series. I'm not gonna, uh, and I'm just, I'm just flashing this because I, at the end, I might make the slides available to any uh, one who's interested, but uh, don't worry about too much of these technicalities, but it's basically saying that this piatic uh, power series converges nicely in such a way that um, we can um, see that log one minus X minus the sum of the first P terms in the series has P adic absolute value less than one over P. So just small exercise in uh, check uh, running through the powers of P and then you get this uh, beautiful theorem. And one, once you have that, then you have a nice congruence that you can truncate the log function mod P at least by a finite polynomial 
And then uh, a simple extension of Wilson's theorem shows that the uh, one over P times P choose J is nothing but minus one to the J minus one over J mod P. And they inject that, they, this, they, they observe this interesting fact. Um, and uh, once you put that into the, into the sum, you get this very nice uh, expansion of log one minus X as one over P times one minus X to the power P minus one mod P. Very nice, very nice result. And so we see relationship between the Piatic logarithm and Fermat quotients. So this proves that if VP of X minus one is at least one over P minus one, log P of X, the Piatic log is congruent to X to the P minus one over P. Now, this does not look like the Fermat quotient because we know the Fermat quotient is X to the P minus one minus one over P. Um, and so we, we can relate it to the Fermat quotients. Um, the Fermat quotient is F of A, A to the P minus one minus one over P. And writing this in the usual fashion, A to the P minus one equal to one plus P times F of A, we have that log P of A can be rewritten using the Fermat quotient, one over P minus one, log P of A to the P minus one. Here I'm using the fact that log X Y is equal to log X plus log Y, which this piatic analytic continuation of the log function allows you to do that. And on the other hand, we have this piatic series, one over P minus one is equal to minus one minus P minus P squared dot, dot, dot. And we can inject that back in and we see, uh, inject that back in where? We inject it back in right there, one over P minus one is a piatic series. And then lo and behold, you get log P A is equal to minus P F of A mod P squared. So thus we have, if A and P are co-prime, F of A, the Fermat quotient, is actually congruent to minus log P A over P. Okay, so this, is this, this they do, they actually do this in their paper. But the, as I said, the Artinian elegance of exposition is not there. So when we relate this back to the Ankeny Art and Chawla conjecture, uh, elementary number theory shows that the product of the quadratic residues A sub S is congruent to minus one, the product of non residues one mod P. Uh, and so if we use that fa elementary fact, we can write our product of A sub S as minus one plus P times something and B sub S is one plus P times something. And now this something has, um, so the P times something has absolute value, you know, less than one over P. So we can take P adic logs and we derive nice congruences that the sum of the Fermat quotients F of A sub S is actually omega mod P and sum of F of B sub S is also omega star mod P. Now, I don't know why, but Carlitz never makes a mention of P adic logs in his paper, but he writes these congruences down. And I wonder how he got them. Uh, he doesn't give any explanation. So it's this crucial discussion that's regarding the Piatic law that's missing from Carlitz's paper. So that's how I find it. The only explanation I, I can think of is somehow this Piatic log was not been rigorously put down and therefore people were using it and not really mentioning how they got their results. There are other aspects of the a a AAC paper that are worth highlighting. Uh, in particular, though they do not use uh, the terminology, they are actually using group rings and Stickelberger elements. And as, as, as many of you know, um, group rings and Stickelberger elements are very important uh, in trying to understand uh, uh, cyclot uh, cyclotomy and, and uh, how uh, these uh, class numbers uh, are related. Uh, so that's probably um, material for another talk, another later discussion. Uh, suffice it to say that this is what we wanted to highlight in this thing. So let me conclude this talk with some heuristic um, considerations of why we think now that um, the Ankeny Art and Chala conjecture is probably true. Um, it is widely believed that for a fixed number A, the number of prompt P would satisfy the V-fridge congruence, A to the P minus one equal to one mod P squared is finite. The way people think this is because A sub P minus one minus one divided by P should be random and um, 
uh, well, I'm sorry, the heuristic consideration <laughs> tells you it could be it could be infinite, but it's very sparse. Like I think the heuristic gives you log log x. Uh, in other words, the number of primes for which p uh, the Fermat quotient f of a zero mod p is expected to be finite, though even though the heuristic seems to suggest uh, log log x, I think people haven't really found many examples where there are more than two or three of these things. Uh, what we have shown in our discussion, nothing big deal, no big deal, all on you know, rearranging and tidying it up and striving for some sort of Artinian elegance in the exposition. What we've shown here is that the, if the ankeny arkenchala conjecture is false, then for any non-residue N, the Fermat quotient satisfies two special congruences. Two. So you have these two congruences it has to satisfy. Now that's not one, it's two. And if these are random things, we would expect the probabilities to be something like one over P squared. So the same heuristics as in the we Fritch congruence case would suggest that they are only finite to many primes. Actually, this is much more on a more solid foundation than the Wefrich business. The Wefrich business I think leads to a log log x uh, conjecture for the number of Wefrich primes. But this leads to a uh, certain finiteness because you have two conditions. So each time uh, the probability of something happening is like one over P, but now you have two of these conditions so it's one over P squared. And since summation one over P squared converges, it's not a log log x, it's a finite number um, in that case. So at least I think this is, this is our original contribution if I have to say it. Uh, the heuristics has been kind of given a little bit more robustness. And more can be said, uh, but for this time, probably this is enough for your consideration. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I thank uh, you know the, the powers that be, uh, the elephant god of learning, uh, Ganesha. This was taken in Kanchipuram temple in Tamil Nadu about 10, 10 years ago or so. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.